I think Narendra Modi, probably we haven't understood fully yet. Why in 1980 does the RSS prefer Indira Gandhi over Atal Bihari Vajpayee? The RSS people said Indira Gandhi is the biggest Hindu. Hai. Sonia Gandhi was there and looking quite distraught and in walks Rahul and he says they killed my daddy, they killed my father, in six months they will kill you if you become Prime Minister. Nevja Chaudhary, you've spent a lifetime observing and learning from and reporting on politics. If I were to ask you, who is India's least understood prime minister or political figure, who would you say it is? You know, Barkha, I can say more than one prime okay. minister. Start with one. But I will start with one. And I will start with the <clears throat> current one. Uh, because it is a, in the present. I think Narendra Modi, probably we haven't understood fully yet. <clears throat> I often feel this myself. And uh, when I travel around the country, that is my endeavor when I talk to people. Of course, he is Hindu Hridesh Ramrat. Yeah. Of course, he is, talks about nationalism, national pride. Of course, he is an OBC and it's the rise of OBCs, we are saying in an unprecedented way. And he's a OBC Prime Minister. Of course, he's got the Labharthis, the social welfareism that he's put out. So many, many people, particularly lower down, have got something tangible in their hands. And he's 24 by 7. Mm -hmm. He's got no family in tow. Which is a big advantage for him. You know, in my travels, I would meet people who would say that Modi ji is corrupt because they don't have children, so they will leave money and who will leave it. Very different from the Western culture where uh, you know you need the suburban family behind the picket fence, the mom, dad, the children and the dog. That's right and they compare with the other families. There are yeah. other political families, other parties yeah. who have sons and grandsons right. and uh, the political legacy is being passed on. And of course also that he's somewhere tapped into an aspirational India. You know, the small town India, the village India, wanting to make it good. And he talks about India 50 years hence, India 20 years hence, 10 years hence. It's not a gloom and doom story that he's dishing out. All that is there. But I feel where we haven't fully understood him is that he is a response to a changing India. And that changing India we haven't fully comprehended yet. And because it's too. a work in progress. It's a work in progress. What is it that we, or you, with all of your experience, can't put your finger on? Like if you were to, when you travel, or I didn't understand this, or I'm surprised to see this. What is that thing when, when it comes to Modi or how people respond to him? You know, I would say also that he is putting into motion and as he prepares for a third stint in power which many people feel he will get as things stand today. And do you feel he will get it? Yes, I think that's the yes. way it's headed uh, as you move around. <clears throat> Though one can never say anything definite in Indian politics but uh, having said that, uh, he is uh, putting into place a civilizational project of the BJP and RSS. Mm -hmm. But Modi stands for much more than ideology and an ideological commitment. So that, of course, is, you know, where I said we need to stand for. Uh, but what uh, I was recently in Banaras, Ayodhya, Lucknow. That's the route I took. Yeah. And I wanted to know, um, you know, what are people thinking? What are people saying? And I had gone to Varanasi after five years and I went to the Ganga Aarti at night in the evening, which I had done five years ago, same place. Mm -hmm. There must have been about 2,000 people last time in 2019. Today, as I sat there, Barkha, there were 70 to 80,000 people on that ghat in the evening. And wherever you looked, in the dark, there were just people and people and people. And I looked around, 
and they were mostly younger faces. Mm. Very few older people. Older people were there, but and on top of the terrace and on the steps and then talking to them. Somebody's come from Bombay, somebody from Calcutta, somebody from Silchar, somebody from Kota. And they've come younger people who brought their young children. And I, I, I sat there and I thought, this is Hindu resurgence. Mm. And it need not be malignant. It may be very benign. You know, a consciousness about your Hindu identity. It's another part, uh, another thing that pol political parties have used it as one Muslim uh, commentator said to give the anti-Muslim tarka on this resurgent dish. But uh, they will make capital of it or try to make capital. But what is happening or those sculpts, uh, sculptors in Ayodhya who are working six months, you know, to uh, carve out the Murti of yeah. Ram Lalla, doing their best, the excellence coming out, you know. Uh, are, are they are not thinking of, you know, this being doing damage to the Muslims or the minority. They are not thinking in those terms at all. So how Modi is making use of it, putting it, you know, giving it a certain direction. But what about the others? Do they understand fundamentally what's going on in society? Why? Is it only the fault lines right. of the past? Or is it much more than that? And yet it's important to say that Hindutva is one factor that defines Modi, not the only factor that defines his popularity. But let's start with Ram Lalla, the Mandir, um, it, and go back to your book. One of the... Uh, things in your book is the Hinduization of Indira Gandhi. Uh, your book, of course, looks at uh, six prime ministers, six Indian prime ministers, and how they took the decisions they did, why they took the decisions they did. Narendra Modi, Prime Minister Modi, has often been compared with Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. So many people who have seen both ages say, if there is one person Modi is like, it is Indira. Uh, you know, Veer Sanghvi said on our program the other day, Modi is the Indira of our time with some advantages. And the advantage he said was the lack of a family, which you started with. Do you believe Modi is the Indira of our times? You know, she is the one uh, they compared him to, have compared him, yes. even in 2014 early. Somebody in the BJP establishment had said this in a private conversation that you, uh, you know, you all compare him to the Dindya and the, you know, the, the mentors are very much free from the RSS uh, pantheon and the BJP pantheon of earlier years. But he takes his leaf out of Indira Gandhi's book. He, that, that, 2014, you, you people yeah. forget talking about yeah. the media. Uh, yes, I mean, the, the, the comparisons are very obvious, you know, a strong leader, a popular leader, a leader who's gone above the uh, his own party. Transcends the moment, yeah. yeah. Even now, uh, Modi's guarantee, you know, it is above the government's guarantee, it's above the party's guarantee. So he's above the party and the government. Yeah. Indira Gandhi, likewise. And very strong PMO. Mm -hmm. Indira Gandhi ruled through her PMO. If you remember her, the, her best years, the so-called golden years, from 67 to 73 when P.N. Haksar was with her. And uh, this Kashmiri mafia. And mm -hmm. then she went in for, uh, uh, <clears throat> of course, carved out Bangladesh. She went in for Garibi Hatao, nationalization of banks, removal of privy purses of princes, all those things which gave her a certain profile that was left of center, pro-poor, and she got the better of the old guard in the party. Now, Modi also, Modi didn't have to face the old guard as Indira Gandhi. She had to navigate her yeah. way. He's had it easier in terms of the party accepting But him. except that he's more self-made than she was. She inherited yes. power. Yes. He, he's, he, his, he, his tenure as chief minister put him in pole position. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned left of center. Of course, Indira Gandhi fell back on the economic policies that were left of center, but on national security, she was completely center right at the very least. The creation of Bangladesh, the 71 war and so on. But what about on religion? One of the points that you have made is that Indira Gandhi was 
I think you said Hindu first and Hindu last. She Hinduized her politics to a degree that the RSS admired her, not just not just for her politics or national security, but also for her Hinduized politics. And the RSS and she develop a relationship such that you argue that the RSS helps her in her political comeback after the emergency. That's right. You know, she visited every major temple in the country between 77 and 1980. They, they, people said there wouldn't have been a temple she left. And that was for two reasons. She feared for Sanjay, that the Janta Party leaders might harm him in some way. And she also used it politically. And uh, uh, right, Hindu, the RSS people said, Indira Gandhi is the biggest Hindu. Hai. So they felt they could use her. Of course, they wanted her. Uh, they were reaching out to her during the emergency to be released from jail. Uh, and she used, she wanted to use them and she used them also. Uh, of course, at the time of the 1977 election, she sent them word, Sang Chunav Se Alag Ho Jai. And uh, they sent her word that it was too late. They were already committed. But after the elections, we will talk again. And in 1980, when she won the highest record, it was the highest number of seats, she had said in private conversation, never acknowledged publicly, that had it not been for the RSS, she would not have got that number of seats. So somewhere the RSS behind the scenes nudged it in the right direction for her and the Hindus did vote for her and she wanted to offset the loss of Muslim support that had taken place to the so, Congress. So, so, so why is it that, you know, I think when you say that Indira Gandhi went to every temple in India, why is it that Rahul Gandhi, Priyanka Gandhi, when they attempt, not that they've gone to every temple in India, but when they attempt to do this, they're called Hindutva light, they're called Me Too versions of Modi, uh, people mock them, Kamal Nath's aggressive Hindutva certainly bombed in Madhya Pradesh. What's the difference? The difference is that I think Indira Gandhi's was seen as a genuine thing and I think she was a believer. Mm. She believed in it. I mean, Rahul Gandhi calls himself a Shaivite. That's what people around him say. Uh, Rahul spiritual. also, you know, I was in Ujjain. This is a few years ago. Uh, and uh, outside that temple, <laughs> talking to a priest who sat there, and I asked him, Ke Rahul Gandhi is going to these temples. What do you make of it? He said, Achha kar rahe hai. Unka problem wo nahi hai. Unka problem hai bhasha ka lafra. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, it's a, com it's a uh, complexity of issues that... But Indra Gandhi was also Rahul. Western educated, was, was also sort of perfect. She was a polyglot. She spoke multiple languages. It's not that she was more... I mean, do you think she was a more rooted, I less think colonized image than Rahul Gandhi's? I, I, Indira Gandhi, I think she was much more grounded. Mm. I think she understood India much more. Uh, Rahul's problem and I think Sonia Gandhi's problem also has been Western oriented in one way, but also rather like what Nehru believed in, that the rights of the minorities, the minorities should be given more rights than the majority if your secularism is to work. That may have been true after the partition and after independence. But today, the majority community will not accept that. But that, you know, the, re, the Congress has to redefine itself. Right. And it doesn't know how to. But for a moment, <clears throat> let me ask you, why did the RSS want to help Indira? Because, you know, they were... And, not, and, and they wanted to help her instead of Atal Bihari Vajpayee. That was the reason. And Vajpayee's tenuous relationship with the RSS continued well into his prime ministerial years. He was not able to change, uh, choose his finance minister. The RSS had veto power over his choices. He had to go to America and describe himself as a Swayam Sevak. And it made so much news today. It would not even cause a stir if Prime Minister Modi identified as such. Why did, in 1980 does the RSS prefer Indira Gandhi over Atal Bihari Vajpayee? Because Indira Gandhi was go was Hinduizing her persona and her politics, and Atal Bihari Vajpayee was trying to secularize mm. his politics and the party that he launched. And they were not very happy. Mm. The RSS uh, with the uh, Vajpayee, he had written uh, 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 an article in the Indian Express where he had 
question the dual membership. He, he said that the RSS parts open its doors to everybody, including the minorities. So it struck that note. He, they were not happy with him. And they thought Indira Gandhi might further the Hindu agenda of the RSS much more. And were they right? You know, I think both were used, trying to use each other. It's not that Indira Gandhi believed in the RSS ideology. Hmm. But she thought she But could. she did identify, not just personally, but politically and in the public space as a Hindu. She did and she realized what was happening at the ground level, the shifts that were taking place. And you know this 1983 very important Ekata Mata Yatra, yeah. the Vishwa Hindu Parishad took out all over with Ganga Jal. And uh, th th this became the uh, example or uh, the prototype to cop for Advani to copy later when he had his uh, Rath Yatra in 1990. Uh, she was supposed to have funded it, according to those close to her. She, she funded the BHP Yatra? And she gave permission for them to hold their conference in Vigyan Bhavan, where they gave a call for the reclaiming of Ayodhya, Kashi Mathura and which is all unfolding now today. Now unfolding today. So how interesting. So was it that she believed in keeping your friends close and your enemies closer? Or was it that she understood and responded to the social currents of the time? I think she understood what was happening at the ground much more. She was much more rooted, had her ear to the ground, uh, had got feedback, you know, which is what dried up during the emergency. And acted according. She was a master at real politic. Hmm. Hmm. Let's talk about these, the, this sense of Hindu resurgence that you uh, feel that you picked up in your travels through UP, the Ram Mandir. In your book, you talk about uh, a conversation that takes place between Narasimha Rao, often accused of looking the other way as the then Babri Masjid is demolished. And Nikhil Chakravarti, senior journalist, they were friends. And this is an interesting time because they ideologically were different, but they were friends. And Rao says to him, and there are other such anecdotes that you have documented, that we can fight the BJP, but we can't fight Lord Ram. That's one thing that you talk about. And the other thing he says is that if this demolition takes place, BJP's Ram politics or Ram centric politics will end. This did not happen. We are actually witnessing the sort of apogee moment, the, the climax of those Ram politics. The Ram politics never ended. Talk about what Rao was thinking at the time. See, even VP Singh before Rao has huh. said this. I could fight the BJP, but I could not fight Ram. And exactly the same thing was said by Narasimha, Narasimha Rao. Rao. And Narasimha Rao wanted to take the Hindu plank away from the BJP. Hmm. And when three days after the demolition of the Babri Masjid, four journalists went to see him, led by Nikhil Chakravarti, who was also his friend. And he was part teasing him, saying, we heard you were uh, sleeping that day when the masjid was being brought down or doing puja. So Rao was stung to say, Dada, he used to call him Dada, uh, you think I don't know Rajniti? Hmm. I was born in politics. I allowed it to happen. Because I wanted to take this Hindu plank away from the BJP. And he thought it has become a festering sore. Yeah. And many people have said this, that he himself wanted to build a temple at the spot. And he got a trust registered. He put people onto the job. And every major sect, and kept the Vishwa Hindu Parishad out. But Every major Hindu sect was part of it, which was registered in 1995, but he lost interest. He thought he would go the Hawala route and mm. other routes. And maybe if we come back to power, he will build it. But he because wanted to build the Ram Mandir. He, he set up a trust to build the Ram Absolutely. Mandir. Absolutely. And, but he, uh, during his term, after 92, the Ram Mandir as, as, an, as an issue, the temple as an issue went on the back burner. Mm. It is true. But Hindu nationalism, you know, the, the Hindus and sections of the community had tasted blood with the demolition of the mosque. They, this came to the fore in a big way. 
and you know we have to again keep understanding this what is what makes for this Mm. resurgence this hindu sentiment it is is it the fault lines of the past how far back they talk about 500 years of struggle how far back do you go in history is it a north indian phenomena a hindi hindi speaking states phenomena and i don't want to create this artifice of a north south divide but certain things are paradoxically and in parallel streams true the BJP, with the exception of Karnataka, has struggled to break into some of the southern states. A phrase like Odinidhi Stalin's comment on Sanatan Dharm can work in Tamil Nadu politics but has adverse effects in the rest of India. Mm. Uh, but P Prime Minister Modi's popularity at a personal level, I was looking at, the, you know, at numbers from a sea voter survey, they actually show you that Prime Minister is personally quite popular in these southern states. And with the exception of Tamil Nadu, where Rahul Gandhi is polled to be more popular, even in Karnataka and Telangana, where the Congress has won elections recently at the state level, the Prime Minister is more popular than Rahul Gandhi for the post of Prime Minister. So how do we understand this evident dichotomy that there is a Hindu resurgence, Mr. Modi is associated with it, does it play out the same way across India? I think, um, Barkha, the South is a very distinct and it is a worrying phenomenon if there is a North-South divide. Is there one? Uh, Tamil Nadu, of course, the Hindu-Hindi has not worked. Someone said to me, a friend of mine in Hyderabad, Sri Ram Kari said to me, the problem in the South is not Hindutva, it's Hindi. That if is there were more, if there were more Hindi speaking, uh, if there were more polyglot, not not Hindi speaking, if there were more polyglot leaders of the BJP who did not come across as Hindi bhasha leaders, the BJP might be they may, different. may be different. And also, there is a whole history of a Dravidian culture. That, but that's that, Tamil Nadu. That's Tamil Nadu. That's Tamil Nadu. The rest of uh, South, I think we still don't know. But you're right in terms of. I don't know of any other prime minister who's been as popular as Mr. Modi 10 years down the line. Nehru, yes, six, 52 to 62. 62, it become frail and he still won the election. Indira Gandhi, 67 to 77, she lost the election. But Indira comes back from emergency, which is extraordinary. She comes back with a historic win from her biggest mistake. That's correct, afterwards. But 67 later, to later, 77, later, later. She, she's routed. 77 yes, absolutely. All over North India. Uh, and then, of course, she bounces back. And uh, Manmohan Singh also, 2004, of course, the mandate was not for him uh, in, in that sense. But in 2009, but, it was. He uh, ran as Prime and, Minister, yeah. Prime Minister of Canada. And uh, 14, he does. Look at the state of the Grand Party of India. So, uh, this is a, again, to to, to be continue to be popular as a leader 10 years down the line <laughs> is a phenomenon, as you say. I was just South. thinking when you were talking that Prime Minister Modi has never experienced defeat. He has won since, since the elections that took place after 2002. He has won all of his elections in Gujarat. And then he has won so far both his terms, poised to take a third term. That has to impact your politics, your sense of belief, your capacity for taking risk, whether it's demonetization or other decisions that, that even those around him may say were not the best decisions. But let's talk about the grand old party, the India Alliance. You documented um, how Sonia Gandhi, unlike what everybody believed was her moment of abdication, was actually quite okay to be Prime Minister. It's Rahul Gandhi, who at Natwar Singh's house, then still in favour with the Gandhis, dissuades her. Then Not Natwar Singh's house, at, uh, at uh, Janpat, the, the Sonia Gandhi's place. I see. And Natwar uh, Singh was present. At the, yeah. And uh, this was, uh, you know, on that Saturday, the Congress Parliamentary Party in, uh, elects Sonia Gandhi. Yes. On that Sunday, the UPA comes into being and they elect her as uh, their leader. Yeah. So she's all set to become prime minister. And APJ Abdul Kalam wrote in his memo as the letter was ready for her to invite her to become prime minister. On that Monday, hours later, there is this meeting in uh, Janpat and Janpat. 
and uh, there is Dr. Manmohan Singh, there is Priyanka uh, Gandhi, there is uh, Suman Dubey, a friend of the family, and uh, uh, Anantwar Singh walks in looking for Dr. Manmohan Singh because he had easy access, he was allowed yeah. in, and Sonia Gandhi was there and looking quite distraught, mm. and in walks Rahul, mm. and he says, they killed my daddy, they killed my father, in six months they will kill you if you become Prime Minister. Mm. And if you go ahead and become Prime Minister, I will do something drastic to myself. Mm. And she's very distraught and then they, she, she you know, Natwar Singh, Natwar Singh is who I quote, who was there and yes. saw it all. Yes. And uh, uh, then they, she goes in and then goes out to meet other leaders where she, who are waiting for her and she talks about Manmohan Singh becoming Prime Minister. So, uh, yes, it was the mother in her who overpowered the So, it politician. was the mother in her and not her inner voice. It was later presented as the inner voice. It was the mother in her who overpowered the politician in her. Because there are very few people who have turned down Prime Ministership. That's right. You know? No, I'm not saying this in a judgmental way. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm merely making the observation that what we saw overtly play out at that time, which was this grand abdication. It was a political moment and, yes. and many called it Sonia's smartest move and so on. She was all poised to become India's Prime Minister. Were it not for her son, she would have become the Prime Minister. That's right. That's right. And remember one other thing that had she not done that, six months, you know, BJP would have made things so difficult for her. How long she would have lasted, we don't know. And because she did that, the Congress party accepted her, the country accepted her, and she went on to be the head of the Congress party. For so her son, years. her son stopped her from making what you think would have been a huge political mistake. Absolutely. I think so. Vajpayee advised her not to take the That's right. Vajpayee How did that conversation happen between them? You know, soon I'm told that soon after she was elected leader of the Congress Parliamentary Party, they had this conversation on the phone and she asked for his Ashirwad. So he said, you have my Ashirwad in abundance, but I would advise you not to take it because the country will find it difficult to accept and the civil services will also find it very difficult. So, they had that, you know, you talk about this relationship across party Ions, lines. Yes, yes. Uh, they had that kind of a relationship to, for Vajpayee to be able to give that kind of advice to a leader about to become Prime Minister. Yeah. So, when we look at politics today, in this conversation would simply not take place between Prime Minister Modi and any member of the Gandhi family. How did it come to be? And again, it takes us back where we started. You said Prime Minister Modi is the least understood Prime Minister because in some ways he's part of an India that's changing. Has, has he steered that change or is he emblematic of that change? I think both ways. It is, you know, it's not one or the other. And... Um, and now, as he views a third term, uh, he's at a cusp. Uh, and some people th say that, th that in his third term, he could become more inclusive. Hmm. And to rule a country, and he's one who would like to leave a legacy. Yeah. He's one who likes to do things bhavya, grand, everything on a big scale. Also, Sometimes it doesn't me, work. Also, I think he enjoys, I have no basis to say this except observation, he enjoys being unpredictable. That of course, to catch you and me and people like us <laughs> completely, you know, that we've not stopped predicting. But you know, it's also do. true that the media, have, even those considered close to the government, have never known as little about what happens as, right. as the media does today. See, media, as far as me, we are concerned, we have less access. Yeah. Media is under pressure. There's no doubt about that. 
uh, to information. Governments always, all governments, all prime, no prime minister likes criticism. All governments want the media to do PR for them. Mm -hmm. So also this government, that, that they feel is their role. But the point I was making is that will Narendra Modi as part of that legacy reach out to the minorities in a new way to make them feel secure and that they are first class citizens and not beleaguered uh, can you know as Hindu Ride Samrat he can reach out in his third term to that kind of what did you make legacy. of his Christian outreach for instance it it happened again without notice it just happened you know and and there's a very um, interesting political outreach with Paswanda Muslims so what's your own sense is Modi going to be a different Modi in his third term or is he going to be the Modi we have known or not fully known as I as am an incorrigible optimist and I I feel you know there's no country as diverse as India yeah. I mean, it is, you travel and you know this, I know this. I find it the most exciting thing, you know, to be traveling. Every 20 kilometers, it's a different India. Language, food habits. The best country to be a journalist in because there's always <laughs> yes. something. There's always a story at every look at. And you know, Barka, we are, for all its fault lines, we are proud of our democracy, that we've lasted as a democracy. So I hope very much that Narendra Modi in the coming years, if he comes to power, will make every last Indian feel secure and want it. Mm. But I want to come to the opposition that's trying to fight him, is trying to maybe not stop his third term, but at least contain the margins of his victory. What's actually happening? There's been only one idea that I can think of mooted by the opposition that was not set or defined by Narendra Modi, and that is the caste census. And it has bombed at birth. It is, it is like aborted at takeoff. Because Mamta Banerjee refuses to publicly even comment on it. Uddhav Thakre has privately made it known that this is not an issue. The India Alliance made an attempt, VP Singh style, to re politics. And it totally crashed. What happened? Number one, they had not thought it through how they were going to put across the idea. Number two, they're not united. Number three, the Congress has never played the OBC card. The OBCs have never identified with the Congress, except in parts of the South, like Karnataka. But the idea was mooted by Nitish Kumar. It came from Bihar. They, they presented themselves as leaders who were born from the sort of Lohiyayat movement. And now we're going to do this for the OBCs. It, may, it will work in Bihar. It may work in Uttar Pradesh if Akhilesh Yadam, you know, carries it forward. Mm -hmm. But with Rahul Gandhi carrying it forward without thinking through. And what is the, how do you, what is the idiom in which you put it? You know, yeah. caste census, how does it matter? You know, it's a cold kind of yeah. formulation. Yeah, esoteric. Yeah. So, uh, I think the India Alliance, all of them well-meaning and I hope they will get on to one on one contest so that they can bring down the BJP tally for uh, checks and balances to kick in uh, because a strong opposition is the need of the hour. But uh, but they are not going about it in a way that inspires. What are the mistakes they've made so far? Uh, Firstly, who's their leader? No, it's not even the leader. It is each one is playing the small game. Right. And they're playing the small game because they are fighting. Each one is fighting for their survival. And that is because they really don't believe they will be able to defeat this huge, this juggernaut, this huge machinery. Yeah, so they're basically fighting to preserve their own backyards. That's right. So there's no one out there. Rahul Gandhi does his yatras and all that. But he too is out of sync with the, you know, main thrust of the battle. Which is? Which is to take on in 2024. So Rahul Gandhi. Now he's not, uh, he's taking on this uh, uh, east to west. Yatra, yeah. Nyaya Yatra. But the regional uh, satraps say they have not been consulted. Are they wanted there? Are they not wanted? That's elementary. Yeah. Rahul Gandhi has framed this battle as a Vichar Dharaki Ladai. 
Do you think this is an accurate way of framing this? Because the India Alliance itself is filled with vichardhara contradictions, ideological contradictions. There is nothing ideologically that unites the Shiv Sena with uh, the, the, the Congress Party. The Ahmadi Party was birthed from a, I don't want to say an anti-Congress movement, but an anti-corruption movement in direct revolt against the Congress. The Delhi Congress probably hates the uh, Ahmadi Party more than it hates the BJP, right? So this Vichar Dhara ki Ladai is a very old way of framing a country that is in change, in churn and change. I think Vichar Dhara is okay, whatever you want to call it. As you say, the common Vichar Dhara does not unite them. What unites them is that they have They don't to, like Modi. They don't like That's Modi. That's not a Vichar Dhara. And, yeah, that, then they have to, you know, uh, bring him down. That, that, that is their uh, common point. And they're all under attack from ED, mm. Enforcement Directorate. So that also is what unites them. But actually what we are seeing is a redefinition of the Republic. Mm. And they need to see what their counter narrative is going to be. What is it that they stand for? But these moments of, I don't know about redefinition of Republic, but one party domination is something India has seen before. The BJP, we forget today, in 1984, had two seats in parliament. It took them decades to get to what, what happened in 2014. The Congress or whoever emerges as the opposition has to play the long game. Absolutely. Do you, do you think the Congress and the Gandhi family can survive? And I, when I say survive, I don't mean physically. I mean political relevance. A third term of Modi. Why not? I, I, I say politically. I'm only asking politically. Uh, of course, there'll be huge challenges. Mm -hmm. But without the Gandhi family, the Congress will disintegrate. You believe this yes. because there has been a repeated suggestion, and I, I have sometimes argued this that the opposition is playing by old rules in a new India, and if you cannot shake up the imagination of the electorate with something disruptive. So Sonia Gandhi, we now know from your book, when she abdicated, it was not disruptive. Her son persuaded her. But to the outside world, it seemed like a moment of disruption. Here was a woman who had a chance to be prime minister and she had said, Main nahi banogi. Rahul Gandhi theoretically could say, I'm never going to be prime minister or I don't want to talk about being prime minister of India for the next 20 years. Whatever, I'm just, I'm just theorizing here. My submission to you is if the Gandhis remain in control of the Congress, they might be what holds the party together, but they also remain what the BJP can constantly attack them for. Absolutely. And, and you know, uh, dynasty, they connote everything that young India doesn't like. Yeah. Uh, but for instance, you know, they could have, when Mamta Banerjee and Arvind Kejriwal suggested the name of Khargi. Malikarjan Kharge, to lead the campaign, they could have absolutely latched onto it. It came from the others, not from them. India has never had a Dalit prime minister. Now you can say in the north he may not have clicked. Mm. I, we don't know. Uh, but l certainly Dalits would have been affected. Mm. And uh, that's the best card you have today to play. So for them to say no, it will be decided after the election, I know they let the moment pass. and. Uh, Maybe it's insecurity, you know, if you give up power, you, they've seen an Arsima Rao, they've seen a Sitaram Kesri in the past, then they may be in trouble. But to that extent, while the, the Congress cannot do without the Gandhi family, because it may break up into small groups. Uh, on the other hand, but the you, Gandhi family needs to be visionary enough to, do to, what? to let go of some of their power. Right. And have, take they, the and have they done that at all in any real way? No, no. they are not letting go of the party in real terms. In real terms. I don't mean the, the gesture of saying we won't run for party president. That, that is also a step forward. <laughs> you know. Uh, but but Nija, at a time when the battle is existential, right? It is an existential battle for the Congress party. We need to see what happens, of course, in 2024. We don't know. Can the same old, same old responses work? You know, there, there is now a suggestion that Mr. Modi may contest a second seat from the South, from Ramesh. Uh, there is talk that Sonia Gandhi may not even contest Raibareli, that Priyanka Gandhi Vadra may step in. 
there used to be a lot of talk, less so now, about Priyanka Gandhi being the better politician. What, what do you think of that? And what have you picked up in your travels in talking to party leaders privately? Uh, Priyanka Gandhi may be viewed a little better than Rahul as a politician, um, but not in the way one thought. I once used to think that she will win an election for the Congress. Mm. You know, she had that charisma, reminded people of her grandmother. grandmother. But that is not people, young people in, in uh, UP tell me, Congress, Congress, kaha hai? We've never seen Congress. They're 25, 26 year olds. And Congress is not going to come. To you know, I was once in traveling in UP. Sorry, I just remember a funny story. And I had my hair grew out in the pandemic, but most of my life I had short hair. And I once stopped to talk to a panwala in, in a little gown in UP, not far from a methi. And that panwala thought, because Priyanka had short hair, I had short he thought I was Priyanka Gandhi. Mm. And I said I started laughing. And he said, Oh, toh dekha hai nahi, toh laga koi ladki aaya, grazi bolne wala, baal chote. And it just struck me that there is such a disconnect. You know, they have not seen these people at close quarters. Sorry, go you ahead. Know, Barkha, the, 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 you know, Barkha, a new instrumentality will come up, I'm sure. When it will happen, five years, ten years, a new energy. Now, the Congress as it exists today is a soft, flabby party that has stopped working hard or going to the people. Yeah, it's like and, a middle-aged beer belly. <laughs> and on the other side are people who are 24 by yeah. 7, driven, yeah. hungry for power. Yeah. I give this example. You know, in 2003, 2004, before they came to power, and I would see senior leaders of the party and they would wring their hands about what about UP would be the last question I would ask. They would say, what about UP and wring their hands? You know, what to do about yeah. UP? Yeah. They're still saying that 20 years down the line. And here is the example I give often of Amit Shah. You can disagree with his politics. But this man, given charge of Uttar Pradesh in 2013, July, in 11 months time from 10 Lok Sabha seats to 71. Yeah. Roughly, so, the same, roughly the same age as Rahul Gandhi, by the way. In so, his 50s, if you I'm know, not wrong. Yeah. it is a thing of a will to power. And yeah. But somewhat some Congress supporters might argue about the Bharat Jodo Yatra. That Rahul Gandhi showed the kind of energy that those who supported the party had urged him to show. What? Why was he not able to convert that into a bigger moment? He was able to mend his image, but not really do much from the Yatra the for his party. What happened? Because I think he has not clicked at the popular level as a counter to Modi, as an alternative prime minister. His moment is not today. His moment may come in the future when the mood turns. Hmm. Uh, but you can't run a, politics with apna time aayega yeah, philosophy. Apna right? time aayega by default. And certainly, uh, or saying that or doing what you're saying, doing the Sonia Gandhi, that I'm not going to be prime minister. Will that work? <clears throat> and if so, who comes in? So in a sense, you know, new new people will come we'll up. To rise. We'll have to rise. And yeah. Situations will have to throw up those So people. let me ask you in the end, you know, reading, reading your book on six Indian prime ministers, you also find that people don't remain on the same path. So Vajpayee, for example, starts as a pacifist who had a kavita on Hiroshima Nagasaki and then becomes uh, someone who takes Pokhran forward, right? Manmohan Singh, mild-mannered, never really uh, asserts himself vis-a-vis -vis Sonia Gandhi, except when it comes to the nuclear deal, says, I'll resign, I'll risk my government. Explain that psychology, that people change. Gov being in government changes you. You change the country. But the country also changes you. Absolutely, Barkha. You absolutely put it very well that it's it's not a static thing. It's a growing evolutionary process. And no prime minister inherits a clean slate. Yeah. It is a growing situation that they have to deal with. And I suppose at the end of the day, even there, they fight for survival. And that is what is the uh, overwhelming drive in most of them. Uh, they also want the best for the country. We've spoken a lot about Hindu resurgence, but we haven't spoken about options, political options for Indian Muslims. What are they today? 
you know they are uh, there's a lot of talk and discussion and churning in the muslim community and they are you know thinking deeply and very pained and insecure and i was thinking barkha if you and i were non hindus what would be what would we be feeling like today hmm. i would say not good not not able to look at the future with hope but there is also and it needs to be said a failure of politics here in that your leadership or your representation cannot come from religious leaders alone right um yes there is talk of the bjp being a hindu nationalist party today but when vajpay and advani rose they didn't rise only as hindu leaders there were other dimensions to them so i just wonder about the absence of political leadership among the muslim community why is that happened if you other than the indian union muslim league and asaduddin owaisi's party i think they may not know the way to go Hmm. at the moment this way that way they may be watching but the initiative could come from the majority com- community having got the ram temple having you know f- feeling good about their hindu identity uh, steps could be taken for reconciliation moves towards reconciliation with the other side and you hope that will happen let me end by asking you what's the one thing in prime minister modi's 10 years that has surprised you that went against your understanding of politics a decision a moment a statement he, he i mean he has <laughs> nobody would have thought that the bjp would be where it is today when uh, you know when advani chose him to be chief minister yeah he was just an ordinary you know worker and people were surprised that he was going to replace yashubhai patel and he was a he was a friendly uh, bjp leader at the delhi office very who would often be there to, in his yes. kurta pajama and rubber chappals and you could go in and chat with him at any point and that and of course he'd had a uh, he came through the ranks yeah. chai wala and the humble beginnings to where he was and uh, never fought an election and that he would take the bjp to such heights in such a short time So you're saying the very and fact of Modi. And a paradigm shift in Indian politics, like it or don't like it. So the very fact of Modi today defies expectation in your, in okay. your experience. The very fact of Modi today defies expectation. Yes, you know that. Uh, or or had you know? Yeah, I, and relent- like ten years ago, you wouldn't have forecast this political. And relentless, you got over something, and there's a new something coming. You know, another new. Now in the south. Uh, He is reaching out south. They are nowhere in the picture, but he is reaching out. And he started where the BJP has no presence politically, that's right? And uh, not giving up. And I think that's what you mentioned that you know, Mr. Modi is the least understood because he represents a country that's still changing, and 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 what shape and form that change will take, or maybe it will be a series of changes. We don't know. It has been fascinating talking to you, Nirja. I have to before I let you go ask a personal question. You started. your journalism with raj mohan gandhi uh, with himmat uh, these were small publications that came up during the time of the emergency you crowd sourced printing press for yes, 75000 absolutely 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 i remember during the emergency when uh, the uh, presses stopped looking at us because we were resisting the censorship and uh, so we moved from one to the next to the next till uh, all stopped and then we put out an appeal and barkha those money orders of 1 rupee that yeah. would flood in is not more than 10 20 rupees at a go you know it wasn't large donation and 70000 that graph went up to and we bought our own press and soon after that of course indira gandhi announced election but it's also important lovely as the story is to remember that many of these moments have happened before in the life of a country it feels to us that oh my god this is the first time but if you've lived long enough all of these debates around institutions media politics personality centric versus organization you have seen these moments before yes i mean you have seen these moments and that's why 
uh, you know, at least for the media and the, I feel the strengthening of our institutions, our democratic institution is the biggest challenge and that's the only thing that will undergird our democracy. Mm. And we have to relook at our democracy also. Well, the challenge is that most people understand democracy in very basic terms. Can we vote? Can we bring in the people we choose? Can we vote out the people we don't choose? Everything that happens between elections, people don't care as much about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's very tough to get the imagination running on yeah. those issues. And we all have to introspect. Why do people not care that much about what happens to media, for instance? It's mm. something I think a lot about. But that for another time. Thank you, Nija Chaudhary. A pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.